I'm Michelle Rook. We'll get an update on the 2018 Farm Bill here from Washington, D.C. On the Soil Health Minute, we'll visit the premier location where NDSU is helping farmers use soil health building practices. And we'll also learn more about what farmers are willing to try. And a retired rural vet looks back on decades of caring for cattle. Welcome to Ag Week TV. I'm Michelle Rook. The House Ag Committee has released its draft of the 2018 Farm Bill with a fair amount of fireworks. Reform of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program was included in the bill, which resulted in committee passage on a 26 to 20 party line vote, which is unusual for a farm bill. Committee Chairman Michael Conaway says the measure will be on the House floor as soon as he can convince the leadership he has the 218 votes needed for passage. I spoke with Ag Committee leadership while in Washington, D.C. to find out if they can get those votes and if they can complete the Farm Bill before the current legislation expires September 30th. A bitter fight over SNAP reform may derail the House Farm Bill. House Ag Ranking Member Cullen Peterson says the work requirements are a non-starter for the Democrats and are being pushed by Republican Speaker Paul Ryan. This food stamp stuff is going to come out of the bill or there's not going to be a bill. That's as simple as that. Because of that, mainly, uh, there will be 100% opposition from the Democrats on the floor. House Ag Committee Chair Mike Conaway responded to Democratic criticism that the work provisions were never discussed before the chairman released the draft. Uh, Ranking Member Peterson had the specific language uh, February the 7th. Uh, we shared with him the concepts back in October. He says the Democrats can argue about the process, but they're not even trying to improve the bill. They chose uh, last Wednesday to criticize the bill for some five hours, but my recollection is not one amendment offered, uh, not one area, not even an amendment to strip it out, start over. Peterson says offering amendments is a waste of time because the House bill will fail. So he'll be working with the Senate Act Committee to pass their version of the Farm Bill, which does not include SNAP reform. If it goes to conference in its current form, I will not support the House bill. I will support the Senate. And so we'll have a conference where you'll have three against one. Ag Secretary Cindy Perdue says there are work requirements in the current SNAP program, but the committee's shift to job training is more beneficial. As they move the money uh, from the food stamp issuance into education and training, and that's, that is the ramp up. Both Purdue and Conaway are optimistic about getting the Farm Bill voted on in May and achieving the 218 votes needed for passage. On the trade front, a U.S. trade team including Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer were in China this week trying to negotiate a deal to avoid the next round of tariffs going into place and avert an all-out trade war. Chief Ag Negotiator Greg Dowd says he told Lighthizer agriculture is at the tip of the spear and should be a priority in the talks. We're the ones taking the first bullets in this discussion. So my simple request to him is, is that been that uh, that means agriculture should be at the front of the line to get our re issues resolved first. In reaction to the U.S. steel and aluminum tariffs, China retaliated with tariffs of 25 percent on ag goods, including pork and ethanol. Soybeans and other U.S. staples are scheduled for the next round of retaliatory tariffs. Now, this week, the president granted an additional 30-day exemption from the tariffs on steel and aluminum to Canada, Mexico, and the EU. An update on the renewable fuel standard fight. EPA granted a financial hardship waiver to an oil refinery owned by billionaire Carl Icahn, a former advisor to President Trump. His Oklahoma facility, CVR Energy, avoided millions of dollars in costs related to the RFS program. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt was questioned at a House committee hearing last week about why the agency has granted 1.6 billion gallons of ethanol waivers since 2016. Pruitt says only plants with volumes of 75,000 gallons or less can even apply. He says the decision is not subjective, but based on Department of Energy information. We use their data uh, and we make informed decisions based upon their data and it's objectively and statutorily driven. And uh, if, if, the, if the criteria met, um, then we have the authority to grant. If the criteria aren't met, uh, we don't. 
Texas. Pruitt says those waivers aren't eroding the RFS and claims the president supports biofuels and is working to allow E-15 sales year-round. However, he did not deny that the White House is still looking at a possible cap on RANs. Monsanto is launching the first product that deactivates the herbicide dicamba in sprayer equipment after it's used. Monsanto dicamba portfolio lead Ryan Rabishko says they'll be launching the new technology to help applicators with sprayer hygiene and assist farmers planting extend soybeans in the 2018 crop year to decrease dicamba crop damage. He says they're hopeful this new deactivation tool combined with this winter's application education will help prevent some of the unintended off-target drift experienced in 2017. Monsanto and Adjuvants Unlimited tested the product, which does not have a name yet. Iowa State University weed experts, though, doubt it will do much on its own to prevent the type of crop damage associated with dicamba in 2017. Ahead on Ag Week TV, a retired rural vet looks back on his decades of caring for livestock. Intelligent farming means more crop from every acre. That starts with smart machines and precision application. Introducing the new Rogator C-Series from Challenger, featuring a newer, smarter, more precise way to apply fertilizers and nutrients, more accurately and more efficiently than ever before, resulting in less overlap and less crop damage. All to make you more productive and more profitable. To find out more, contact Butler Machinery today. Microessentials is a premium phosphate product. It's a dry granular product. The main difference with a Microessentials type product is you have a homogenous granule for the nitrogen, the sulfur, the phosphorus, and in this case, the zinc is all in one granule. If you ever have a desire or a need to learn more about what does sulfur do within a soybean plant, what does the potassium do for the corn crop, we have microessentials.com. We also have a great resource, cropnutrition.com. Small or large, Superior Grain Equipment has a storage solution for you with a wide variety of bin options and accessories, along with site planning and superior customer service. Plus, from top to bottom, we offer the industry's best bins and warranties to protect your products and your grain storage investment. Get superior quality, protection, and reliability with generations of experience and dependability. Make the superior choice today with Superior Grain Equipment. If you're thinking about selling a piece of land or you're looking to sell some farm equipment, or if you're thinking about a retirement or involved in an estate, give us a call. We'll sit down and tell you all about the Steffes way. We think it's a good way. That's how we approach it. If any of those are in your plans, give us a call or go to steffesgroup.com. Learn all about us. Hope to hear from you. Get your row crops off to the right start with an early riser Case IH planter from Titan Machinery. Case IH early riser planters feature high-tech yet rugged planter row units that quickly adapt to the toughest seeding conditions, while leaving an optimal seed bed to promote early, uniform plant emergence. Only Case IH early riser planters are designed to leave a flat bottom seed furrow, ensuring consistent seed depth and even emergence. Contact your local Titan Machinery location today for more information on the next generation of planting technology from Case IH. Red River Valley farmers saw an average drop in profits of nearly 30 percent from 2016 to 2017. That's the finding in a new NDSU report. At the same time, the median midpoint farm declined in income by nearly half. NDSU Extension Farm Management Specialist Andrew Swenson says the Red River Valley County's report is based on data from both North Dakota and Minnesota farm business education programs. Farms in that program saw a big run-up in profitability from 2007 to 2012. But figures have declined since then, with the exception of one big yield year in 2016. Now, the mean average net farm income was nearly $103,000. That's down from nearly $144,000 in 2016. The median average was around $53,000, down from nearly $105,000 in 2016. Net farm income is down. It's probably down greater, I'd say, than the average would indicate for the quote typical farm, given that the median had a you know much more severe drop. Another reason net farm income is down 2017 is that uh, government payments were were down from the previous year. 
Swenson says one surprise is that despite lower fertilizer prices, costs were up slightly in 2017, and he's expecting 2018 will be another challenging year. An overall state report that includes counties outside the valley in North Dakota and Minnesota will be analyzed and released later this month. Michael Pates has much more details looking at the numbers in the next Ag Week magazine. A longtime Cooperstown vet retired a few months ago at age 84. For nearly 60 years, Vernon Knudsen practiced in a wide area of North Dakota. But as Jonathan Knudsen tells us, livestock, friendship, and his many stories remain part of his life. I think it's so nice to be able to do what you like to do and, and you know, make a, make a fair living on it. For me, it's the people. Vernon Knudsen has been a fixture in North Dakota agriculture for more than 50 years. If you've had cattle in a big chunk of the state, you've probably worked with him, and you've probably heard his stories. You know, if you don't take care of them, they're not going to treat you right. And Dr. Knudsen has been caring for them for decades. I did a lot of the horse work early because I kind of liked it, and, and uh, mostly cattle. Knutson grew up on a western North Dakota ranch. After an army stint, he went to vet school at the University of Minnesota, where he met his wife, Lois. <laughs> they visited several vet clinics before joining Dr. Delbert Clark in Cooperstown in 1962. Webb, the county agent, he says, uh, Call Dr. Clark, he might want somebody. And they said, no, he's got a guy coming from Kansas. He, he's all set. So probably a month later, I got a call from Clark's wife. She said, Delbert wants you to come. You've got 24 hours to decide. <laughs> Knutson has delivered thousands of calves and treated countless sick and injured animals. He sold his share in the clinic to younger vets in the early 2000s, but stayed on for years as an employee. I was working for wages, you know, and they, they said, you got to keep, keep a time card. I said, what's a time card, you know, so. Though fully retired now, he still has his stories, memories, and a herd of 40 cows. We have one, one old horse, and she thinks she's a cow. She's my lead cow. I call Dolly, or Goldie, and uh, she comes, and the cows come with her. Neighbors can't figure it out. Huh? So Vernon Knudsen's long, strong connection with animals continues. For Egg Week, I'm Jonathan Knudsen. Jonathan will have much more on this story coming up in the next Ag Week magazine. Coming up on the Soil Health Minute on Ag Week TV, learn how these soils are changing as a result of using soil health building practices. But first, a planting progress update and your agri-weather outlook for the coming week. Advanced Grain Handling is your regional dealer for grain handler dryers, bins, and accessories. With Grain Handler's continuous mixed flow drying systems, you're capable of high levels of grain dryer efficiency on all types of grain, including seed grain. Advanced Grain Handling also carries West Steel's quality stainless steel products for on-farm and commercial grain storage solutions. Advanced Grain Handling has licensed and trained service techs and a licensed electrical shop. Get a hold of Chad Kylo to find the perfect solution for your farm. If you're thinking about selling a piece of land or you're looking to sell some farm equipment, or if you're thinking about a retirement or involved in an estate, give us a call. We'll sit down and tell you all about the Steffes way. We think it's a good way. That's how we approach it. If any of those are in your plans, give us a call or go to steffesgroup.com. Learn all about us. Hope to hear from you. Get ready for the biological revolution. Enhanced by Ag Concepts is a scientifically designed foliar fertilizer formulated to quickly deliver essential nutrients to your crops for the greatest possible yields. I had a hail incident and I only had maybe beans that were four inches tall. I put some Enhance out. That seemed to really bring my beans back. I got 40 bushel beans compared to a zero. That's the best dollar ever spent. Join the biological revolution with Enhanced by Ag Concepts. Levisol is the most advanced nutrient efficiency solution, making phosphorus, zinc, and other key micronutrients more available to the plant. With three modes of action, it unlocks the nutrients in the soil, it makes the nutrients that it's applied with more available, and it is mobile in the plant for season-long activity. For more information, talk with your agronomy partner or visit wcdst.com.
Luckin Trucks and Parts sells quality used parts for all makes and models. With over 50 acres of trucks and parts and new inventory arriving daily. Family owned and operated since 1966, Luckin's specializes in the sale of quality used medium to heavy duty truck parts as well as pre-owned trucks, trailers, and construction equipment. If it's on a truck, we got it. Call us today and let us get you your part. Welcome back. This week's USDA Crop Progress Report confirmed the weather-induced planting delays. Corn planting nationally is at 17 percent, 10 percent behind normal. Regionally, farmers in Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota did not turn a wheel as of April 29th, while Iowa was in line with the average pace at 3 percent, and Nebraska was slightly ahead at 6 percent. U.S. spring wheat seeding stands at only 10 percent versus the five-year average of 36 percent. Minnesota and North Dakota are at only 2 percent and 3 percent respectively, well behind the normal pace. The biggest delay is in South Dakota, where planting is 51 percent behind. The winter wheat crop nationally is still rated only 33 percent good to excellent. That's up 2 percent on the week. However, this is still the worst rating in nearly 20 years. Drought has severely cut yield potential in the crop in the southern plains, and that was confirmed on this week's Wheat Quality Council tour. In our region, only 32 percent of South Dakota's crop is in good to excellent condition, up 10 percent from a week ago, while Nebraska's crop is in much better shape at 63 percent good to excellent. So what do the planting and crop prospects look like for the coming week? John joins us now with the answer. About three weeks ago, there was snow on the ground everywhere from the North Pole down to at least as far south as northern Iowa. The weather pattern was suggesting It wasn't going to warm up anytime soon, and we were wondering if we were ever going to get into the fields at all. But the pattern did shift. Not only did we uh, see a pattern change, but the ground is starting to dry. We've gone from cold, wet weather to warm, dry weather, and it has impacted a lot of things. And May continues to look warmer than average as we get into the month. Rainfall, there have been some storms around, not very many. And generally speaking, conditions have been getting drier rather than wetter. We're not in any type of serious drought situation yet anywhere. It's pretty early in the summer for that, but there are areas that are starting to look a little dry. On the U.S. drought monitor nationally, you can see that uh, there is here in the northern plains some areas, especially western North and South Dakota, that are a little too dry. Some of these spots getting into the moderate drought category, but that's actually relatively typical for late April, early May before you've had enough storms really going to populate the ground. That's not to say that things will improve prove. I'm not really saying that. I'm just saying that so far it's not a big problem. Red River Valley area is not bad. Most of eastern South Dakota not bad. And once you get down into the Corn Belt, Iowa, for example, if anything, it's a little too wet. The drought is here. Texas Panhandle area, there have been a few storms in Oklahoma and Texas and Kansas lately, but it's still very, very dry in those areas. I mentioned the Corn Belt doing just fine. There are some dry pockets up into southern Iowa, and the weather has been dry in the Corn Belt, but field conditions conditions are generally doing just fine. Weather pattern shaping up, the jet stream has gone way north, at least for the time being, and that has allowed much warmer weather to move over western North America, and it looks like it will generally stay that way for a while. And by warm, a lot of this is 70s and 80s, a little bit lower than that in the higher elevations of the Rockies, but it's an above average pattern. Cold stuff is up around Hudson Bay, and it lingers there, and we're starting to get a few fingers of heat in the southern plains, and it looks like that will continue as we get into the second period, May 13th through 19th. Some of that's even going to sneak up into parts of uh, the central part of the country, I think. Meanwhile, precipitation-wise, scant showers here and there. Probably not a lot of widespread rains, but you never know when a little system like the one you see here might generate just enough moisture to uh, give us enough to get uh, crops germinated and and uh, and uh, set things back uh, back to right. But I don't see a lot of widespread big precipitation centers in either of the northern plains or, or the upper Midwest over the next uh, couple of weeks or so. It's just not looking like it's going to be that wet. There are signs of a jet stream pattern shifting into a west coast trough by the end of the period too early at this point to indicate if that's going to mean more beneficial rains in in late May or not. 
Superior Grain Equipment offers storage and drying solutions designed for your grain handling needs. Mixed flow grain dryers from Superior offer even heating to reduce heat stress cracking so you get higher quality grain, higher test weights, and better prices. Plus, they use half the energy of conventional screen dryers. Experience cost savings and superior grain conditioning. Make the superior choice today with Superior Grain Equipment. Get your row crops off to the right start with an Early Riser Case IH planter from Titan Machinery. Case IH Early Riser planters feature high-tech yet rugged planter row units that quickly adapt to the toughest seeding conditions, while leaving an optimal seed bed to promote early, uniform plant emergence. Only Case IH Early Riser planters are designed to leave a flat bottom seed furrow, ensuring consistent seed depth and even emergence. Contact your local Titan Machinery location today for more information on the next generation of planting technology from Case IH. Intelligent farming means more crop from every acre. That starts with smart machines and precision application. Introducing the new Rogator C-Series from Challenger, featuring a newer, smarter, more precise way to apply fertilizers and nutrients, more accurately and more efficiently than ever before, resulting in less overlap and less crop damage, all to make you more productive and more profitable. To find out more, contact Butler Machinery today. Microessentials is a premium phosphate product. It's a dry granular product. The main difference with a Microessentials type product is you have a homogeneous granule where the nitrogen, the sulfur, the phosphorus, and in this case, the zinc is all in one granule. If you ever have a desire or a need to learn more about what does sulfur do within a soybean plant, what does the potassium do for the corn crop, we have microessentials.com. We also have a great resource, cropnutrition.com. The Ag Week Soil Health Minute is sponsored by the North Dakota Corn Council and the North Dakota Soybean Council. Farmers are looking for information on ways to reduce tillage and include cover crops in their rotations. In our first Soil Health Minute of the 2018 growing season, Dr. Abby Wick visits a special farm that's leading extension efforts related to soil health building practices. So I thought I'd kick off this season's Soil Health Minute by being out at the site that started it all. So we're here at the Soil Health and Agriculture Research Extension Farm, also called the Share Farm, to show a little bit about what we're doing as far as research, but then also what we're doing with extension programming. This site is funded by farmers through the North Dakota Corn Council, Soybean Council, and also the North Dakota Wheat Commission. So farmers are contributing to the work that we do here on a yearly basis, not only through their funding, but also through their ideas. The Share Farm was started in 2013, and on site here we're doing research related to conservation tillage, using cover crops in rotation, salinity management, and also soil health assessment. What we do here with the extension program is we take the information we learn at this site and we take it out to the entire state through our Cafe Talks. It's probably the best known extension program we have with the Share Farm. It's a great way for not only farmers to get information from NDSU, but also NDSU to get information from farmers and consultants. What we found with the Cafe Talks is that farmers are most interested in the concept of interseeding cover crops into corn. And so almost 75% of the farmers were either going to try that practice or they were willing to try that in the next year or so as a result of attending cafe talks. So we took that practice that we learned about in 2016 and we applied it here at the share farm where we interseeded corn that summer. We put cereal rye and radish into our mix and then the following spring we planted soybean directly into that living cereal rye as a practice that farmers are also interested in trying. The soil here is changing rapidly since we converted this field to no-till in 2016. We have aggregates in here which now resemble the appearance of cottage cheese. We also found our first earthworm here this past fall of 2017. And earthworms are a great indicator of a soil recovering and becoming healthier. I also want to show the residue on the surface here since we converted to no-till in 2016. You can see this, the corn stalks that are left here are starting to decompose. You can see the standing stubble from the soybean. And you can also see a little bit of the cereal rye residue here on the surface. So we have excellent protection against wind erosion at this site. And I think with the decomposition that is occurring, we shouldn't have any issue planting weed into this field this year. 
This season, I'm excited to show you more practices farmers are using to build soil health, not only on Ag Week TV, but also in Ag Week magazine. If you'd like to see more information on soil health building practices, you can visit the NDSU Soil Health webpage. Still ahead on Ag Week TV, a new report is giving lamb producers a reason to smile. Get ready for the biological revolution. Enhanced by Ag Concepts is a scientifically designed foliar fertilizer formulated to quickly deliver essential nutrients to your crops for the greatest possible yields. I had a hail incident and I only had maybe beans that were four inches tall. I put some Enhance out. That seemed to really bring my beans back. I got 40 bushel beans compared to a zero. That's the best dollar ever spent. Join the biological revolution with Enhance by Ag Concepts. Where do you go for the latest news in agriculture? Ag Week Magazine. Reaching over 70,000 farmers and ranchers in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, and Montana. Ag Week provides the most up-to-date information on the markets, the trends, and the people who make it all happen. We're your source for news, not fluff. Dependable. Trusted. Ag Week. Subscribe today by calling 1-800-811-2580. Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%. That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. I'm Jenny Garth, and as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. Even though we are one of the most food-rich countries in the world, 15 million children don't know where their next meal is coming from. This is unacceptable, and something the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks is working to solve. Instead of accepting that our country lets billions of pounds of surplus food go to waste every year, Feeding America has made it their mission to help families in need by rescuing this food. Through food pantries and meal programs, the nationwide network of food banks provides more than three billion meals, serving virtually every community in the United States, including yours. Join me in supporting Feeding America and your local food bank by visiting feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're feeding America. There's good news for lamb producers in a new report from the American Lamb Board. U.S. consumer demand is up, and they're willing to pay more for lamb than they did a few years ago. Lamb meat comes from a sheep younger than a year. Among the reasons given for the increase are higher consumer incomes, higher prices of substitute meats, a growing consumer base, and promotional efforts in the industry. Lamb is also popular with some religious and ethnic groups whose numbers are growing in the United States. Americans ate just over a pound of lamb on average last year. Even with that increase, lamb consumption is small compared to the 57 pounds of beef and 92 pounds of chicken that the average American ate last year. Thanks for watching this week's edition of Ag Week TV. Remember, for all your ag news, go to agweek.com or download the Ag Week app. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. See you next week.